Have you ever played Chinese Whispers? This is the game where you pass a message along a line of people and the meaning changes from person to person. And there's always one guy that decides to change the meaning to something completely stupid. So one of my favourite movies growing up was Ali G in the House. And uh, there's a great scene in that film where there's a whole line of people and they want to pass a message on from person to person to get the driver outside to turn the engine on. When he finally gets the message, the meaning has changed to say that Ali G actually wants to get with a granny. Anyway, the method of passing on stories and messages by word of mouth is actually the same for music too. For 99% of people in history who couldn't read music, and a lot of them who actually couldn't read at all, this is how their music survived over time. And when I say their music, I'm talking the music of the actual normal, everyday people that make up history. In this episode, we're going to be talking about the music of the ordinary people, and how their songs and traditions were saved from dying out. Every country and community has their own stories and tunes that they sing for different purposes. For example, folk songs can be used to help people work. Miners would sing along in strict rhythm to help them keep their spirits up. This is the same reason we have sea shanties too, like uh, What should we do with a drunken sailor? What should we do with a drunken sailor? What should we do? In classical orchestras and in the courts, it'd be very rare to see women performing in public, but these rules and regulations wouldn't apply to local communities, and often it'd be women that knew these folk songs, and these could range from lullabies to, I don't know, stories of love gone bad. So you can see that in folk music, the role of women didn't have the same stigma as it did in the Western art tradition. Even if you're not super knowledgeable about music, there's a pretty strong guarantee that you've probably heard a folk song in your life. They can take on the form of a nursery rhyme or a church hymn and a lot of the Christmas carols that we know today, they came from the folk tradition too. And that's why they're so memorable. They sort of had to be catchy, otherwise they would die out. It's kind of like musical Darwinism. The strong will survive. At the beginning of the 20th century, portable recording equipment started being made available by the inventions of Thomas Edison. And this meant that it was possible to capture the songs and tunes of communities before they died out forever. The only thing is, the recording equipment in those days was not so great. I mean, listen to this. It's not exactly HD quality, is it? So armed with new recording equipment and a pen and paper, these composers would take it upon themselves to find authentic folk music. This attempt to connect with the real people sort of would have been frowned upon in previous generations. So in the last year of her reign, Queen Elizabeth I ordered for all Irish rural harp players to be got rid of. In her 1603 order she said, Hang the harpers wherever found and destroy their instruments. <laughs> so this kind of distrust of the common people meant that for the musical elite, folk songs were more of a curiosity than anything of true value. So in Hungary, at the turn of the 20th century, a couple of composers in particular were getting out there and breaking new ground by collecting these folk songs. These guys were called Bela Bartok and Zoltan Kodai. I wish I was called Zoltan. Zoltan! 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 That's a do where's my car reference for anyone. They started taking the raw rhythms and melodies of the folk tunes and started putting it into their own music. But Bartok was taking it to the next level. He was going international. So he went to North Africa, he was going to Turkey, he started going to Asia. But for today, we're going to take it back to Britain in the 20th century and we're going to be looking at the guys that helped save traditional British music. Cecil Sharp is one of the most important names in British folk music. His mates called him C Sharp. I just can't resist terrible, terrible musical jokes. <laughs> if anyone's got any more musical jokes that they want to put down below, then maybe let me know. So his life's work's been immortalised in the Cecil Sharp House, which is actually in Camden in North London. This is where the English Folk Dance and Song Society live. Their mission has been the same for the last 120 years, and that's to save and preserve traditional British music. So in collaboration with the brilliantly named Sabine Baring Gould, hundreds of folk songs around Britain were collected from villages and communities, and they put together in little volumes that could be played for the everyday person in their home. And soon, homes all over the UK had the sound of the countryside at their fingertips. So Cecil Sharp actually got in a bit of trouble once, when he was recording the folk song of a gypsy woman. So the husband came and was like, Oi mate, what are you doing with my girl? Or something like that, I don't know, I wasn't there. So apparently the only way that Cecil Sharp managed to convince this guy not to kill him was by playing him the recording that he'd made of his wife singing. So he wasn't trying anything dodgy guys, don't worry. So one of Britain's most famous composers in the 20th century was a guy called Rafe Vaughan Williams and he continued in the tradition of collecting folk songs and just like Bartok did in Hungary, he would take these folk songs and the rhythms and the melodies he'd put the tunes into his works and sometimes base an entire piece around it. For example, he's got a piece for orchestra called the English Folk Song Suite and this is literally a whole composition made up of the folk songs that he collected. When we think of ballads nowadays, it's usually some diva singing it on The Voice or on The X Factor, complete with wind machines, smoke machines. Oh, 
These are full-on pop ballads, and they can be heard in karaoke bars across the world. But the original kind of ballad is a folk song. And these evolved from the wandering sort of medieval minstrels that would go around singing tales of people like Robin Hood, and there's a folk song called The Ballad of Chevy Chase. So one of the most important people in collecting ballads was a guy called Francis James Child. <laughs> Not looking super childlike here. So the nature of these ballads was all pretty epic, talking about kings, knights, murder, supernatural creatures. I mean, it sounds like an episode of Game of Thrones right here. So these ballads were like the blockbuster movies of the day, and they were passed down from person to person in that Chinese whisper style until someone like Francis James Child came along and started writing them down and collecting them. So the efforts of these composers like Bartok, Kadai and Cecil Sharp helped break down the social barriers between composers and the everyday person. These folk song collections massively inspired other musicians to look within their own native traditions for inspiration. As well as being a folk song collector, Zoltan Kadai actually founded a form of teaching music which is based on the folk music tradition. And it's still taught in schools all around the world. And if you want to know a little bit more about it then I'll put some links down below. So it's Kadai Technique. So these guys set a trend, and soon it became pretty common for composers to go out into the field and live in these communities, and use them for inspiration for their own work, as well as giving back to the communities as well. This became a big deal for composers in the 20th and 21st century, and started becoming known as ethnomusicology. Even though in 2016 we're massively well connected around the world by the internet, there are still musical cultures to be found and discovered, and this was all made possible by the enterprising ways of the folk song collectors. Thank you so much for watching again, and as always, check out the Spotify playlist below, and you can also listen to the music that we've been talking about in all the previous weeks too. So if you guys have any comments on this episode, or you've got ideas for future episodes, then I'd love to hear your thoughts, and I'll see you once again in the next episode of Talk The Music. This isn't a game I'm good at. I've got this! <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's nice, isn't it?